but let's get through the the monitoring section of things Oops, i'll skip that let's skip this too we've seen that so the challenges of remote monitoring so of the distance is a, a, a incredible and so that equals staffing and resources just getting out there and you hear the stories of people uh getting to sites and there's nothing to sample so there's those sorts of issues um and obviously there's some safety issues and access issues when it's wet and high flowing so it might be that it's dry when you get there it might be that it's too wet when you get there so there's uh, all those things add up to some serious logistical constraints there's also the unpredictability where and when will it rain um it can be really patchy and flush uh, flashy and you want to you know um sometimes hit those first flush events sometimes you want to be able to um, sample once that's gone through so uh you, you can have those really um, unpredictable hydrocycles in some of these systems especially in recent years right um and then you, because of those systems and um you know there's those interactions between the groundwater influencing those systems are you getting um, inputs from groundwater or is it um, going the other way the, the surface water going into the groundwater so there's definitely variability between sites issues and very variability between the times in the seasons um, and even between years like we've been hearing about so I, I really I was really asked to do this bit because of the technologies and the potential solutions putting and there's some caveats on some of this stuff but some of this stuff is pretty much in R and D, but these are all things that have promise, and certainly, you know, give us a couple of years with some of these things, and I think they're going to come through. But these were some of the things identified in 2013: passive sampling. So, at Ranger, we do use automatic samplers triggered by events. Um, so, once our loggers see a, a turbidity or a, a conductivity event, they can sample and take a metal sample, um, and that's quite good but it still needs staff and people maintaining that and you know it's not necessarily going to be for everyone um, and of course we've got the um, telemetered loggers that um, integrate with that um, looking at EC, turbidity, um, pH and temperature. What I really wanted to show though is you know there's some cost effective um, options like these CTD divers we use them quite a lot for places like Narbalek where we're not got staff and we don't go all the time. So they can do conductivity temperature. And sometimes that's a good amount of information to actually help you target where your sampling needs to be perhaps in the year after. <clears throat> These online metal an analyzers were something, I haven't looked into them for a while, but back in the day, there was this arsenic one called the arsenator and we fondly named the uranium one, the urinator. <laughs> but <laughs> that was our, our name, not the company name. And they do me they do measure metals in real time, but they they were really at high levels. They, they were too high for environmental um, times. But I was having a look at these ones, and they're down to five micrograms per liter for what was it? Um, oh, I should have written it. But for some of the metals, they they're getting low. But obviously, environmental conditions are really going to influence how well they work. So I've seen them working on mine pits really nicely. But when you've got like you know milligrams per liter of um, aluminium and things like that, so Maybe in some of your contexts, they might work, but of course, there, there were high levels of detection. I, you know, I'd love to, um, and it's actually on our books for future projects to actually try and advance that technology a little bit so we get the right sort of uh, um, uh, levels of measurement that we need. Uh, DDTs have been a, a favorite thing for a while. They were mentioned earlier in the thing. Yes, they got to stay wet. This thing here is an auto sampler. I mean, it's expensive. It's about 10,000 euro, I believe, or something like that. But that actually keeps things wet in the system. Now you could uh, design a system, not all these things are cheap, but like if you really had motivation to use DGTs, they um, definitely have their pros. You can deploy them for days. Um, you could, those, those things have a, a, a carousel of, you know, a, a dozen or more um, DGTs that can just move around at period to, periodic time. So you could match it to a flow event when and actually catch it. Um, you, you need to validate these things. They, they measure um, a time-weighted concentration, sorry, and a bioavailable fraction. So there's benefits for that. It's actually really good data that you can get from a DGT. 
but they do, you do need to understand them, study them. We're doing that at the moment um, for the range of mine. And we're having some challenges when you put them in soft water, put it that way. So um, there's that sort of uh, thing to consider, but you can bounce off some good work that's been done. Trang, um, we collaborated with for an ACARP project. You can go and find that report. Actually, come and ask us for us because it's behind a paywall for some reason. But um, it, it was a good project. She validated for a bunch of medals for the, for the coal mining industry. And um, it, it's, you know, you can, you can play off that stuff. Like there is, if there's some understanding in certain water types that match yours, then you can use that to, to your advantage as well. So enabling technology is a big focus of our research program because we're looking for techniques that I, um, have high spatial temporal resolution, taxonomic resolution where we can, that they're safe, they're cost effective. And um, like I said, for the sediments in the um, groundwater earlier, they um, can unlock these uh, impossible environments or previously impossible environments. So the, uh, sorry, I should have perhaps flipped that the other way. So these are the technologies that are really um, the focus of our research. We've got genomics and other omics, such as metallo metabolomics, but let's not get into that. We'll just really focus on the eDNA stuff for uh, monitoring because that's the technology that's maturing. We use videography as well. Um, uncrewed systems such as um, your drones and your satellites. Um, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, it's a big buzzword, but it's definitely got its place in environmental monitoring. Um, big data, cloud computing, um, and infield processing and analysis would be also very beneficial. And it's funny, once we came up with like, this is the kind of thing that we're going to get into at, um, at OSS, we discovered that NOAA actually have the same, exactly the same um, focus for their future. There's a whole lot of people doing these technologies, so we're not doing it alone. And these things are going to be mature really quickly because everyone, it, it can help a lot of people. Ness had a look at this back in 2017 was a report um, and I'll, I'll refer to that at, at some stage and we helped out a fair bit when they did that review of enabling of what, what was the remote environmental monitoring in northern Australia. Um, so they were scoping what sort of things would be beneficial um, for northern Australia. Genomics. Oop, go. Oop. Almost got it. Go. Nope. Ah, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. That's a, supposed to be. A, thank you. Click it. <laughs> so what is it? So we call it omics at our um, research institute because we're actually interested in the full gamut of all the uh, molecular processes from DNA all the way through to um, those DNA um, genes becoming proteins and then metabolites in the environment. So that little uh, video is that process going, well, actually only goes through to proteins, but those proteins make the metabolites that are important. So we're focusing on DNA and eDNA because it, like I said, it's a bit more matured. And environmental DNA, um, that's uh, all the extracellular DNA that's shed into the environment that's um, found in the water or sediments. Not everything we do is eDNA, but let's not get into the actual nuances of that. And there's different ways you can look at that. You can look at these metabarcoding. If you're in the uh, uh, workshop next door, you'd, you'd, you'd know all about it, but that's where you amplify short sections to identify species. But there's other ways you can go about it. And that's shotgun sequencing, the metagenomic side of things where you blast apart a, um, a genome and then you reconstruct it and you can look at all the genes present and the abundance of genes and that has a different lens and a different way of looking at the um, environment. We are looking at metabolomics. They, uh, that is increasingly difficult. We're, having, we're getting help with CSRO for that, but they can help validate some of the inferences that are being made from these Amplicon data sets and these metagenome data sets. So the benefits that we're, we're trying to realize is um, we, we can make it faster rather than waiting on taxonomists to um, you know, count all the samples, we can hopefully get it done quicker. Um, the things are speeding up, the, the more um, these services are being provided across Australia. Cheaper, um, I mean, it, it probably is at the moment, like you know, morphological ID can cost you 
a fair bit of money. Um, sequencing's coming down all the time. That's the chart of what it costs oops, per genome. Um, so you can see it's a dramatic um, uh, drops in cost. And the way that that's working is that the, the instruments are just getting more powerful. So you can sequence more per sample. So you get more done um, on the one run. And we get more information than traditional methods. At the moment, we can only really go to family level because of the effort it go, takes to go to species level. Once we do genomics, we go to species level straight away. But we can also break it, that, bring it back to family level and do some really good comparisons. So we get higher taxonomic resolution. If you can sample more, you can do it um, quicker. You can get higher spatial temporal resolution because you can get more samples. Um, and we can detect some of those rare species, invasive species, the biosecurity all over this. It's a, a big part of their um, future. Um, and it really helps you understand uh, things like ecological function and connectivity, as Anthony Chariton talked about in the actual conference. So it can identify single species through um, quantitative PCR. We can do multiple species through metabarcoding. Um, metabolomics and multi-omic processes can actually help us understand those ecological processes and functional processes. And it increases the measurable um, components of the eco ecosystem. We are looking into population dynamics for some of our work because within those genomes, you can get what they call SNPs. Um, and that tells you the um, flow of and co connectivity of populations within the environment. So you can get a whole heap of data that we're really just skipping over at the moment. And this is a good example. Like this is where we measure um, most things. And this is the actual whole ecosystem. So we're really looking at a very small part when we do it the, the way we're doing it now. So there are guidance documents being created. A lot of these are focusing on the basics of um, how you measure in field and uh, your QAQC. And that um, there's guidance on how you basically optimize your, your, um, your protocols. So we helped out with these. Um, uh, this is a group of Australians that did this. The Swiss have come out with some guidance documents as well. And that's really helping standardize the field. We talk a lot about standardization it's coming, but like th these are the documents that and the processes that you need um, before you get there. There are genomic service providers. You might have met the Enviro DNA team during the conference. They are providing services. Um, they're very strong in the spe single species de detection, but they will do some meta barcoding as well. People are out there doing this. It's not perfect at the moment, but and there's there's going to be more optimization as we go along. Um, but it's certainly informative. Like I mentioned for um, earlier when we we're having the discussion, comparing the same site, that going back and doing repeat sampling, it has a lot of power. You can really compare the same thing um, very well using these techniques if you stick to your protocols. And like I said before, it's especially useful when you've got no other options. <laughs> I mean, that's real power of that. Sediments, groundwater, hyperios, that's where we've found it really, really, well, essential. So there are challenges and, you know, uh, we, we were discussing some of them before. Um, abundance always comes up, but honestly, richness at a uh, species level is going to probably be sufficient for a lot of what we do. And we've also got a future where perhaps we're going to look at PCR-free sequencing because the PCR actually introduces some of the biases that don't allow you to do um, abundance. And that's going to be some future research for us and others. You need some technical no knowledge to, to avoid errors, but I don't think that that's a huge impost. Like understanding how to do a clean sample for water chemistry is pretty pretty, um, you know, good, good guidance would be allow, allow you to do that. Just understanding where your foreign DNA comes from would, would you know, it, it, can, it can happen, um, but I think it's very solvable. You get large data sets. I mean, that's a huge problem. And, and managing that, processing that, that's all going to be part of the game. Computing side by side is part of the uh, solution for this. Um, the bioinformatics is is a is an, uh, headache, and especially when you get a lot of um, data sets in. Reference libraries, that's why these little bugs came up. We've been building this um, DNA barcode library 
for our purposes, but a lot of people are missing them. That's why you get some silly answers such as, you know, a fox up north or something like that. What's happening is they're, they're not identifying, it. like it might be an 80% match and they should probably have not called it anything, but, you know, the closest was perhaps a fox in the Pilbara or something like that. So you see it all the time and it really puts people off. It's just an understanding of like how good those databases are. And there's got, we're in discussions with like, how, how can we make, just expand this? It's a real infrastructure need for Australia. So that's why I like to, to talk about it. We don't have standard measures, but we've got good guidance about um, how to do it well. And we're moving towards things being, um, you know, robust and more robust perhaps than, than they've been in the past. So here's some examples of people using them. This is by Elise Furland. She's fantastic. And Jenny Davis. They, this is actually really about a methods paper and really about, you know, um, where the errors were coming from. But they went to some water holes in Ar Arid Australia and they aimed to detect the uh, vertebrate species that were using those. So, you know, in the temporary systems in the middle of Australia, um, that the, the fact that it was a methods paper and they were really focused on the sources of error and things like that really put confidence in those detections that they found. And they found, you know, a wonderful array of um, things that were using that uh, water hole and that supports conceptual models of what are your values of your water hole? Like sometimes you don't even know what's going there and now you do. Um, another example is uh, Jenny Davis again, she's doing some great work. Beetaloo Basin, extensive area of extensive interest because of the uh, shale gas reserves that um, the NT government especially is um, looking to uh, exploit, I guess is the word. And um, there's been some baseline st studies going on for some time. If you have a look around, they've been publishing. Um, Steph, uh, uh, I can't remember how to pronounce her last name, but she's a great taxonomist. Um, and they've done some good work with taxonomy, but eDNA as well, showing that um, within the uh, Beta Loo Basin, it's not endemism so much, it's actually very um, connected, and that's in the title there. They also looked at um, uh, the, the fish in the, um, the, the, the water holes and things in that basin, um, and they found that, you know, using eDNA basically doubled the number of detections of fish compared to netting and electrofishing and things like that. So it really did show the power of how you can, you know, maximise your assessment efforts and minimise your effort in some ways um, with eDNA. And like I said many times already, it's great for groundwater. Okay, let's pause. You are you are correct, and we'll get on to the rest after afternoon tea. So, what do we ten? Yes, I agree. I need it too. Ten, fifteen minutes is what? What was it for? Fifteen minutes. Okay, we'll be back in fifteen minutes. So, let's continue on though. So, remote sensing and uncrewed systems, another big enabling technology that's really maturing. 10 years ago um, at Eris, there was, you know, a lot of skepticism, but like they're really being deployed across now for, uh, you know, satellites, it's still uh, more and more useful. They, they're doing a lot more passes over things. So you get more data sets more quicker and that solves some issues with like cloud cover and things like that. So very good for landscape scale changes in habitat and um, water, well, quant quantity, but, it can do water quality as well, but not without some limitations. Um, you know, we've got these really good systems now. Uh, the NASA SWAT system um, can measure large-ish um, water bodies and things like that. Um, and uh, there's these uh, really good projects where they're looking at global trends in freshwater quantity. Uh, water quality can be... Uh, of, of small systems, they, they can be very challenged with that. But that's where these uncrewed vehicles come in, the, your, your drones or your RPAs, your UAVs, uh, whatever you want to call them. There's got lots of different names. And we've been using them at Ranger for your fine, finer scale landscape and landscape and habitat mapping. You know, you, your riparian zones is really good for that. And we look at our aquatic vegetation. <clears throat> 
We've thought about doing turbidity and chlorophyll A. Um, it can be a little bit challenging still with those systems, um, but we're actually using them for water collection too, which is really handy for when um, systems are very hard to get to and you've got big lizards hanging around and things like that. Sorry, I, I wanted to have a video of our, we, we recently flew it and uh, was quite successful collecting two litre water samples. Um, I, may, I thought I did have a slide there, but anyway, maybe we'll get to it. So this was from 2017. So, you know, a number of years ago, and these are the limitations they came up with. So they said that they're not fully tested uh, for a range of uh, scenarios. And uh, processing time at that stage was uh, a, a limiting factor. I'd say that if, you know, people are working that out, but there's still large data sets and they um, still need a level of expertise to be able to um, resolve, turn nice images into actual data. Um, CASA licensing and all that sort of stuff. We spend a lot of time, well, our chief remote pilot, Renee Batalo, has uh, made a career out of being our chief remote pilot. And um, it's, a, it's like managing a fleet of aircraft in some ways. I kind of hope that that's going to be streamlined as things move on. Um, uh, beyond visual line of sight is a, a, a super issue. You've got to do some pretty intensive training to do that. So it is, they are hurdles, but you know, more and more operators are going to offer services within environmental sciences. And the more there are, the, I'm sure the cheaper it's going to get. I'm not sure it's like this one. Appropriate sensors to cope with environmental conditions in Northern Australia have not been tested, et cetera. Um, I don't think we've had too many problems with sensors. So I wouldn't have said that, that the ones, um, you could probably cross that one out. And again, data processing. So just handling data and um, uh, all that sort of stuff. Battery duration gets better all the time. Um, and they've got some nice little um, other systems that don't necessarily um, even use batteries. Uh, uh, do I have a picture of a drone in the box? I thought I'd put one in. No, that's the water sampling. I did put that in. So drone in the box are a thing. So rather than actually go to site, you send the box to the site, you open it up or a non-trained operator will open it up and um, it will do the survey. Um, you do need beyond visual sign of, uh, beyond visual line of sight type training and things like that. Um, but that kind of technology and swarms and things like that, like really keep an eye on it because it's, it's here. Like they've got some fantastic videos of, you know, um, industrial operations where they come out of the box and they check their, pipes or wires and things like that. They've, they've been employed now, they're here and that they are now. So weather conditions obviously um, can be influential on the quality of data, uh, the time you fly and all that sort of stuff, but people are working through those sorts of challenges and they pretty much understand what they are. It's pretty hard to fly in the rain, for instance, but you know, if you've got an automated system, you could probably work around that. Um, so water collections, so that is our little, there he goes. He got two litres of water from a billabong and we didn't have to go anywhere near it. And that's real, could be a real game changer. Like we've got a lot of systems in place um, and we don't necessarily need it for Magilla Creek. We've got our um, pontoons and sampling methods, but for, you know, ad hoc water sampling and places that are hard to get to when we go to a billabong that's got, you know, thick vegetation, this is the way to do it. And the USGS have these papers out. Um, they, um, you know, mine pits, like how hard is it to get into a mine pit? So I reckon they're using it a lot for that sort of stuff. And there's some great pictures and video. They've got a very fancy system um, that th what we have is an off the shelf. We're going to test it. We do, we'll do side by sides, but they got some great data. Like, you know, how straight is that um, correlation between boat samples and their system? So um, they got two little, sam two little samples. That's good for us so we, we're trialing it and we think it's got more than just potential I've got no doubt this is going to work for us videography this is something we've been employing for many years now it's um you know it's not high-end kit we use gopros they're like a thousand bucks each we put quite a few in the creek though to get our, our transects but it gives you really good um data and we had to replace that because um, of safety concerns and crocodiles in the creek, we stopped our um, normal sampling. The metrics changed, um, we, 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 we know that. 
but we've got some nice side-by-side -side studies to show how this semi-quantitative um, uh, measure of abundance max N, which is how many fish of a certain species on a screen, um, how that works and, and what it is. But we've got low costs. Uh, well, the cameras are getting lower in cost. The, the uh, quality of them are going up and the battery life are going up. So these things are improving all the time, right? They're getting smaller, they're getting better. And um, it's, it's got some advantages, permanent record of for QC. Um, we've reducing time, staff time and field work. Our pop netting that the way we used to do it was incredibly resource intensive. And you've got great um, social media <laughs> uh, content as well. It's really good for stakeholder engagement. They love seeing the un underwater videos. This is how we're using artificial intelligence for that as well. But honestly, it, it, artificial intelligence is going to touch in so many places like big data, analysis of data, predicting systems and things like that. So we've got 300 hours of video per year. We're still counting that manually while we work through these AI, um, you know, develop it up and label enough images because um, you need to train the database. And there's certain things that it's not doing perfectly yet, but we, we're certainly getting there. We've invested a lot of time in it. And the effort that we're going in it will be able to use, you know, will be beneficial to others. Um, so, you know, 50,000 labeled images is, is what we had. I think we got more than that. So I think that, um, you know, as we build that database for the gaps that we have, it's, um, it's certainly going to help. So 100 hours of video can be processed in two days by AI. Um, and we get in good accuracy for certain species, but it's a school. The small schooling fish, you know, you get a ball of fish going past the camera and the AI has a bit of a hard time um, checking it out. And this is a bit of a live um, identification of fish. It looks very pretty, um, but you can see the, the names being assigned to the um, fish and um, they're the confidences that the um, algorithm's giving to the fish that are being identified. But turning that into data and an analysis is... Um, is something that I think we're still working through. Well, we are still working through. Big data analysis. Now I wanted to talk about this. This, you know, it's that, that a thing that really uh, is there. We all know it. We like I said, it was a big conversation in Canberra for a while and it really could um, help. We've got all these unconsolidated, unorganized data sets. They have various owners. Uh, Susie Vardy, as she's walking out, said number three on the list of um, the heads of EPA is data sharing and data. Everyone knows that there's power in this. Now, um, going back a few uh, years ago now, I can't remember. Uh, it, it was after the 2019. Um, uh, so it was 2019. And a bit before that, there was a group of people going around saying that we need a national environmental prediction system. It was a basically an ENCRIS proposal to organise data so it could be analysed. But it was about water quantity, um, you know, vegetation, turn were involved in this. They were really helping out with that. And it wasn't water quality. So we got on it. CTAC did that workshop in 2021. It's actually, that's wrong. It's 2019 that we did it. I oh, know it might have been, anyway, it doesn't matter. So COVID probably hurt the whole thing, but we put our requests in for that. We said, great idea, but what about water quality? What about eDNA? What about biodiversity data that can go to these, you know, prediction systems? See you, Ross. Bye. Thanks for coming. So I still think we should not let this die. I don't know what happened. I had Steve Morton and Andrea Hinwood and some other friends of ours were, were on that panel driving it. Um, um, and anyway, I, I emailed Steve the other day. I haven't got a response saying, what happened with this? I think as a group, we should say, this is a need for us, right? This could really help. Another potential solution for these temporary streams and it really just sort of um, popped into my head during the conference when we had Bob Muir on the stage saying, indigenous ranges are your eyes and ears on the land. Well, you might've said the sea because he was talking about the reef. But anyway, <laughs> um, he was the first plenary at the, the conference. And it really, you know, made me think about all the citizen science that is being done. 
uh, Trop Water have been doing some great stuff with the eDNA space. They've got um, uh, 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 indigenous rangers out collecting water samples, going through process, training them to so that they can do biodiversity surveys. A lot of that single species detection at the moment, but I know they're very much interested in the the meta barcoding and the the biodiversity um, uh, analyses, and that will be the next step. Um, these lovely ladies again, Jenny Davis um, and Erica, on the back of that Beetaloo Basin data set, they're actually going to all the landholders um, in that Beetaloo Basin and saying, send us your water samples and we'll do some eDNA sampling. So they they could be sitting on a gold mine of biodiversity data that could be used for um, environmental impact of the um, shale gas industry that might come up. It, it's gonna be very interesting to see how that goes, but um, I think you know they're gonna have data at least about the groundwater resources and what's in it and things like that. There is definitely a need for, if we're putting it in the hands of rangers, landholders, things like that, good guidance, good QAQC. Um, and, you know, that would help with acceptance within regulatory frameworks and with regulators. Right, so that's it for me. But the enabling technologies, they're in various stages of development. So, you know, I'm, I'm here with the caveat that we're getting there. Watch this. I think, you know, we're not talking decades, we're talking years now where these things are going to start appearing in, um, you know, some of these decision making regulatory frameworks. There's a drone in the box there. I've got a picture of one. Um, they have incredible power to increase spatial and temporal sampling and taxonomic resolution. That's only going to help decision making, I believe. Um, and we really aim to automate a lot of our data processing and enable non-technical people to conduct the sampling. So like I said, the Ian Potter grant, but you know, indigenous rangers on site um, at, at Jabiru and think that's, that's the ultimate game for us is to put high-end technology in their hands, easy to use, but um, backed by, you know, really validated science and things like that. Thank you, questions? Uh, and before I go further and forget, because I'm getting a bit forgetful, um, we had a conversation at um, afternoon tea and um, we, we're losing people too. And rather than push on and do the, we really wanted to do an analysis of the, the sorry, I'm getting tired. Uh, <laughs> it's been a big week. So rather than push on and do that data, it's sort of the gap analysis and what have you, what have you learned? About, what do you think about the, gaps and things like that. We're going to survey people next week. We're going to send out a survey. You're going to have time to think about it. Um, and we will contact you very soon next week with a list of, you know, what, what do you think from the workshop we can improve on and things like that. So rather than rush it and rush through the content because we've still got a little bit to go, we're going to give our minds a bit of a break and, and do that. And we've spoken to the water quality team and they're good for that. So, um, uh, we're, we're very keen to hear your views on that, but um, we're not going to push it. Rick. Thank you. Sorry, I'll just add to that. So throughout the day, we've just been compiling a list of needs as the discussions have been had. So we've got that list of what people have been saying is needed. Um, and that's a, an awesome starting point. And so the survey will include a list of those. We can look at um, respondents ranking them and then even asking for additional any additional needs that people think are important. So yeah. that's kind of where we'll go. Yeah. It's just around the video survey with the fish. How far are you down the track around species? Are there certain species that you need more imagery on? Yes. Um, <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to send me a list? We may be able to. Oh, that, and that would be great. Like one of the things we really wanted to do when COVID got in the way was workshop um, uh, what we'd done, bring a bunch of people together because what people are doing is they're going off and developing their own algorithms and things like that. What we need is training databases, right? People to label those fish. And it, I've been told it doesn't matter if you put a trevally from the ocean in the same database. It actually helps the same algorithm learn still. So 
that'd be wonderful. Um, we should probably go back and still visit that. Um, but there is the lowland billabongs. We know we've got the channels. When I say we've got 80% accuracy and the, that's the channel billabongs, the lowland billabongs is going to be uh, a PhD to actually advance that. Chris has got a comment. I don't think it's a species so much, but I like a, a school, a large school of, you know, hardy heads versus rainbows. So, yeah, we got it too, but we just haven't put it through. So we just haven't used the imagery, that's all. Yeah, we're still doing it manually because we've got these uncertainties, but um, we need to test it a bit and still we're still playing with it. And um, once it's working, I think we'll get some really useful um, uh, metrics out of it. Sorry, this one's not what I'm using, right? But <laughs> my laptop out there. Uh, are there any questions online? Oh, you can come, mate. Sorry. Are there any questions on the chat? Oh, uh, okay. Thank you for checking. No, apparently. Let's move on then. Oh, wait, there is one from the Yes, we use DJIs, um, M300s, M600s for the bigger. So we've got a whole fleet of different things. We've also got a, a VTOL, a vertical takeoff and landing for very um, large or larger scale um, uh, surveys. Uh, we're playing with all sorts of stuff. In fact, there was some conversations with Renee and um, biosecurity when they were very interested in how many pigs and buffalo were in um, Kakadu National Park and doing really big surveys because no one was really sure. Um, they were talking about defence style drones to do that. So we're talking, you know, very expensive things. Um, but I mean, biosecurity, when lump lumpy skin was going through Indonesia, they were very keen on um, getting those numbers. So there was some motivation there from biosecurity, which would really help environmental science as well. You could see, you know, when you collect these da these data images, they're just so full of information that you can analyze in so many different ways. You know, you're talking about habitat destruction, you know, like uh, Alicia would, you know, I mean, all those things we've been talking about, they, they, they can really get out there and get those data sets, but they can be expensive. They, and they, and they still need a bit of technical expertise, but that's all just improving. Like, I, I can't believe how far we've come in 10 years. And it's only getting faster and faster with the usability and things of them. Push the button, mate. It takes a little while once you push it. So if the green light's on, just push it until green light comes on. Those were also saying that, you know, you can overestimate the, yeah. The value of a drone when a Cessna driven, a, you know, flowing over the same area can probably get the same data. Yeah, it's got to find its place, and it's like the 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 eDNA with the videography, right? Like we 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 they're complementary. They're going to give different answers, but I guess at the end of the day, one might win out over the other. When it it might be that taking a water sample is way easier and gives you more information than putting videos and um, even getting AI to count them. So, I guess um, that's one of the the fun things about our work and one of the benefits of what we get to do is we're, we're testing these things and those, those being able to test those things, other people will benefit from that. It won't be just for us. It'll be for the, the rest of the nation. All right. Who's up next? Chris? <laughs> Thanks, mate. That's the nicest thing you've said. Yeah. So we have to just, in your mind, we've skipped a few things. We're just, we'll have to put this back in place in our brains as we go forward. All right. Um, I'll skip over a couple of things here. Um, hello, testing. Um, the way, weight of evidence approach we're adopting um, integrates bugs and macroinvertebrates largely, um, habitat, which includes um, sediment or uh, 
the riverbed um, characteristics, uh, vegetation, whether it be in-stream or riparian or and riparian, um, algal uh, complexity and, abun um, and yeah, abundance, um, and water quality data. And the water quality is usually restricted to um, Chris Chem stresses the, um, the measurables in the field, um, total nutrients, uh, turbidity. We have used chlorophyll A, but we dropped that. Uh, did use to use DOC or TOC, we dropped that because they're not informative for our um, objectives. Um, we compile all that data um, into uh, a framework that was first published in 2006. Uh, using a biological biological condition gradient uh, framework model. Um, now that um, allows the description of a conceptual model um, according to increasing um, so biological response in relation to increasing human disturbance allows us to describe up to six um, condition ratings, and it's it's site based rather than catchment based, but um, you know, logically, if you have a, a representative number of sites, you can probably scale it up to describing the catchment. Um, so that's the um, artistically <laughs> representative um, uh, model arrangement of the Y scale biological measure or response, according to a condition gradient, um, the intolerant taxa and tolerant taxa I think follows the Titan sort of previous graphs. Um, um, I don't quite understand the fish um, sort of relationship, but um, that's for a biologist to comment on. Apparently, uh, fish biological response improves with increasing um, stressor gradient. I don't get that, but anyway. Um, now, oh, right, okay. Um, didn't know that was going to happen. So look, I'm, I'm uh, grabbing at straws here a little bit in terms of how this works. But yeah, uh, the tier one, that's that's um, otherwise described as a really good condition, a pristine environment, highly natural. So you've got attributes on down here in terms of species sensitivity. Um, and it's it's a it's a textual, a descriptive conceptual model. So the increasing level of disturbance, um, you've got a descriptive explanations for biological complexity. I probably should not talk any more about it because I don't quite get it, but it's not a numerical quantitative model, it's a it's a descriptive conceptual model to describe biological responses. Uh, that are having to deal with increased stressor concentrations in proportion to a human disturbance gradient. Um, yeah, so we use an expert panel approach because this isn't um, equation based. This is this generates um, outputs that need to have experienced ecologists to interpret the data. So we started out in two thousand and eight with nine. Um, qualified um, aquatic biologists and we've we've got, refined it now we only need three or four so every year we do this we um, all the data are reviewed by a, an expert panel it's only three or four people now because we we get differences of opinion as how do you how do you interpret the data um, so yeah but it it is um, what has he written here? So it's it's it is biologically driven. So the macroinvertebrate data is is the core, and the water quality and habitat information is supportive to the to the assessment of of the biological responses. And I get back to the point that dry sites can can be assessed as well. So we're not reliant wholly on the presence of water. We have an ability to put um, habitat vegetation characteristics. Um, and land use description into the same model to come up with an, what we consider to be an expected condition for that water course or a provisional condition of the water course, um, given that there's no water there. Um, so we upload all that data onto the website. So that's, that's the communication model. So we do this 
for the purpose of public communication. We describe the condition of the waters and we release it on the website. And we just, we, we say that um, on the six level sort of scale of excellent, otherwise known as pristine or really, really good through to really awful. Um, and really awful would be a, like an urban creek that's subject to continuous stormwater inputs, et cetera. Um, so that, that's the communication model, right? Um, I don't understand, oh, hang on. Oh, how do I go back? Can you press the back button? Yeah, that, I, yeah, so I don't, I don't, talk to Peter Gernon about that, I'm sorry. Um, the next step, so this is getting really cool because um, we've um, got the capacity to um, divide the state's surface waters up to 120 odd thousand reaches. I think a reach is defined in GIS language. It's about 100 metres or 100 and maybe 200 metres length of water course. Um, and using um, the, uh, the data uh, land use, um, rainfall and a various other desktop available data, we've got a predictive model using boosted regression trees, which I don't quite understand a bit magical, um, but it has a very funky output and we can validate the prediction of a, a watercourse condition or the condition of a reach um, of watercourse. We predict its condition on that six level scale and we've validated it with observational data. Um, and an output from that is this. That's not all the state's waters in South Australia, the bottom right-hand corner in the Southeast doesn't fit the models very well because um, many of the Southeast um, landscape areas are highly modified. They've been turned into drainage lines. They were uh, wetland systems that didn't drain very well. So to turn them into viable agricultural landscapes had to drain them. So they just long straight channels and it doesn't really fit the models terribly well. And they're not, temporary anyway. So in terms of this being a temporary waters workshop, that that um, you can't see down here with the derived, but that's the, the scale. Green green areas are very good. There's hardly any excellent water courses in South Australia according to this model, because just about everywhere is impacted to some extent. But there's the green's very good and that's in the Flinders Ranges, which are largely unaffected um, through to very poor as a prediction. And then we've, we've validated that so far, we've got about an 80% success rate in, in, in predicting the condition of watercourse reaches. So we think that's pretty cool. Um, it, it, well, if it's got an 80% success rate in predicting the condition of a watercourse according to our model, it sort of says, well, why do we need to go and monitor? If you can predict the condition of a watercourse by knowing uh, adjacent land uses um, and various other desktop available information, why do we need to go out there? We will need to keep going out there to help validate it and we need to figure out what's happening in the southeast. But it's, it's, it, it goes to the point that the condition of a watercourse, whether it be temporary or otherwise, is heavily influenced by its catchment characteristics. Um, that's, I think, the end of me. Thank you, Clive. And thank you for uh, representing the state. And uh, please pass thanks back to Peter Goonan and the team for uh, sharing your content and things like that. Do we have questions? Last chance, he's about to jump, yep. No, because there's people online, yeah. Uh, I, I didn't notice. Did you include geology as one of your characteristics? Uh, not geology as such. No, it's um, uh, so not soil type in the landscape. Um, uh, not to say that that couldn't be done. It's just a matter of is, is that data available on a statewide layer? And it is, but it's pretty coarse. Um, we've got pretty good land use uh, delineation and description. Um, and we've definitely been able to, in that sense, describe 
lump watercourses into three categories. Um, one, heavily dominated by native vegetation. Uh, two is in the middle ground of broad scale agricultural impacts and three screwed over by industry urbanization intensive ag but not geology thank you clive there's real opportunities big data there's a real thing in canberra a couple of years ago wasn't it <laughs> and it sort of slipped away and i i will talk about it in the monitoring section but um, I think consolidated data sets that you can analyze have got to be part of the solution to some of these problems that we're having. Now, okay, so let's go backwards. Thank you, mate. Um, there we are. So we did skip a few steps there. So we, um, hopefully you're familiar enough with where we're going and how that fits in, but we can reflect on that once we get to weight of evidence approaches but we're back to move on um rick is going to do step seven so we'll try and put you out of your misery quickly you see we finish with a rush we do four steps all at once <laughs> um so yeah and this is similar this will be quick because it's similar to Chris just talking about weight of evidence and that there's nothing really in these steps that is going to be particularly unique for temporary waters that it's worth bringing up. Um, the issues are kind of similar across whether it's temporary waters or permanent waters, whatever. Um, so step seven, uh, just quickly, I'll do step seven and eight. Uh, remember these step seven and eight were the ones that asked, can we do better? Can we do better in our measurement and assessment program and can we do measure better with regards to our management actions? Um, so step seven, you know, can we consider additional indicators or refine our water or sediment quality objectives? And there's not really anything to add here that's specific to temporary waters. The guidance on the website is specific, probably not much more. Um, uh, I mean, it might, you know, you could do some scenarios and it might include some uh, understanding that the, your originally selected indicators were insufficient or inappropriate, given the fact that you're realizing you're system is different than you thought it was with regards to variability or whatever uh, and therefore you need more indicators or you need different types of indicators it's the sort of thing that happens at step seven uh, and you might think oh, our initial guideline values that we selected and they might have been the default guideline values actually don't really suit our system so we need to find some more appropriate guideline values um, and that was actually the case with regards to the magnesium example i gave um in step four for the pulse exposures originally we were just using the chronic continuous exposure value and it wasn't until we commenced the continuous monitoring that we noticed the degree of, of transients and pulses in the system and realized that our guideline value wasn't really aligned with the actual nature of the exposure so that's really a step seven decision and similarly with ross and his rum jungle um case study in that they used defaults originally i think realized they were in, in appropriate for the system and then they went to those site specific ones and ross presented that as a step seven thing in his case study so that's the sort of thing you're looking at here uh and they're good additions to the um to the framework uh and step eight again considering alternative management strategies nothing much there's guidance we've got the hyperlinks to the guidance on the website um and, and people can go there and have a look and that text would be applicable uh and then uh pretty much the same with step 10 which is about implementing and agreeing a management strategy and notice i just skipped step nine altogether which is in some ways a repeat of step six when you but you're going back and assessing if you can meet or achieve your water quality after you've gone through those decisions about can we do better uh, but step 10 um not much really specific and just just to round it out really about what it what it is and as i flagged earlier the focus here is on well firstly reporting the outcome to the process that you've been through uh in and, and with regards to whatever objective or use you were with it was it um report carding about condition or was it around impact of a waste discharge or whatever uh and associated with that then any action plans to actually implement your management strategies based on the outcome to the process and then obviously you need to keep monitoring you may need to start monitoring you may need to tweak your monitoring program so doing that uh, and then the last bit of course is that ability to feed everything you've learned back into the framework as you then move from steps 
step 10 back into step one. And again, the frequency with which you do that. Hey, are you sure? I thought we'd just go around once more <laughs> just for fun. <laughs> um, yeah, the frequency with which you do that will depend on your use. So again, one of the seven typical uses is about developing catchment or water quality management plan. Those sorts of things are done, really only done kind of five yearly. So you're, you're really only going through this process, you know, quite infrequently. Um, but when you're monitoring impacts, whether it's the mine site or something like that, it's in some ways, it's somewhat of a continuous cycle. You're always learning and adapting and refining and tweaking. Okay, so that's all for that. I don't know that we'll have any questions on that, um, but happy to field any. To the guidelines after we'll we will share the uh, with, with, with once I, I I actually haven't got agreement from the, the presenters, but I assume that they would be uh, happy to share the presentations. Uh, amongst the group, uh, will they be in the presented to, to the guidelines? Um, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, maybe that's about are they will they be embedded with or incorporated into the guidance provided on the website? So a number of these examples and case, if that's the question, a number of these case studies examples you would already, you'd already find on the website. But I think uh, if some of the outcomes of today are about updating the guidance that is within the guidelines, then this sort of information plus extra would. would and maybe they mean that. the specific guidance on temporary waters, um, maybe attaching it to that um, perhaps. Yeah, uh, yeah, and that'll, that will depend on effectively what the outcomes of the, the needs analysis is and the priorities and, and then how they're best implemented. But, you know, the goal is to give users better and more up-to-date advice on how to assess, monitor temporary waters. So. Yep. As much info and guidance as we can provide, the better. Alicia, you need a microphone though, sorry. No, you do. The people are mine. <laughs> oh, great. Sorry. Oh, I think it's just that we want to get that multiple stroke around there. So you're getting concentration of salts and increase in temperature and that kind of thing. How do we consider that from a guideline perspective and will there be more guidance? Yeah, you should have been here earlier. Oh. <laughs> no, so it's, it's. I mean, those issues are recognised as being issues and uh, and Melanie earlier in the day raised the issue of multiple stresses. Um, and I think uh, the guidance on multiple stresses is probably needed and it's not just specific to temporary waters. Obviously, it's important for temporary waters. So that's somewhere that the strategic planning process might might go down depending on stakeholder views. Sorry. No, that's all right. Sorry. Thanks, Sorry. thanks for joining us. Never too late, mate. I can't believe we shall. What's with all these questions? It's too late. <laughs> <laughs> go that's home. Point here, <laughs> Thank you. It's just around the guidance for temporary waters and particularly for a lot of the um, stakeholders where they've got an impacted site and they want to look at something like continuous improvement. Is there any capacity around guidance documents to embed something in continuous improvement and sort of options for how to set interim guideline benchmarks? Yeah, I, well, there is. And there is guidance on the website around that, but it's, you know, maybe hard to find. I don't know, but um, continual improvement is one of the sort of overarching philosophies of the guidelines. Um, and then in other areas, with it, um, it discusses around the ability to set interim targets. So, for example, you know, for the toxicant DGVs, we have these 80% species protection values, which aren't really recommended, but they are a, a potential use when you've got degraded systems and you're looking to, to get them back up to some state. But to try and set a, a target that's way too high is somewhat unrealistic and difficult. And so you can start to look at interim targets, such as using the 80% values, and start to actually get to effectively implement management actions that can get you there rather than trying to get the whole way. So there's information regarding that. But if, if more is needed and, and there are temporary water specific issues, then why not? 
Chris has got a comment um, on it. It's one of our typical uses for remediation. I can't remember. One of the typical uses is assessing a remediation plan, yeah. and and that may that may go into interim targets. Yeah, um, we had this, the statistics of remediation in the two thousand guidelines. Yeah, yeah, so good. And Ross is definitely had some recent experiences around jungle experience as well. That you know lessons learned there. And things like that. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to cut it off there. Yep. Um, this was the open discussion session that we hoped to have, but ran out of time to have. In some ways, I don't mind because we had a lot of online participants and a good interactive discussion would have been difficult with them. And the best way to canvas their ideas and views is through online survey. And everybody's knackered after either even just this day, let alone four, three days prior. Um, and so, as Andrew said, we'll take this offline We've been documenting the needs. We'll do an online survey, and um, and that will hopefully result in a good outcome that feeds into the strategic planning process. And I think I'm going to hand over to you, Andrew. Yeah, I am. And, and a, um, philosophy, I guess that something I've said a number of times to people throughout the day is this shouldn't need another ten years before we revisit it, right? Like this should be the start of something rather than. Um, you know, a point that's going to wait a long time. Uh, so uh, thank you very much to everyone that prepared content. Oh, my God, it was a big effort um, at the end of the day, uh, but it was so good to get all that material together. It's quite a resource, and I think um, I'm going to think about how we might perhaps um, make the most of that uh, effort as we go forward. But thank you, Rick, Chris, Shelley, and Chris, uh, there was uh, Ross, of course, Peter Goonan and Clive. There was um, Tim Storer. Who? Phil Whittle. That's right. So many co contributors. Alicia, sorry. Did I say you already? Oh, I'm so scattered. But um, uh, have I forgotten anyone? I want to remember everyone because it was fantastic. Um, and even like just the... Uh, the discussions of the PCG beforehand, they couldn't, not all jurisdictions could be here, but I had some good chats with like NT and things like that. And thanks for joining us online too. So thanks for the people in the room. It's great to have a, a decent number of people in the room um, asking some great questions. And there's, um, there was about 20 people online, but I think, you know, like we saw with hydrobiology, there was, um, that wasn't really, reflective of the number that actually joined because I knew there was a few rooms of people that were um, um, attending. Very much thank you to Dick Shew and the water quality team, Julia and um, um, Tony, <laughs> I am certainly tired, <laughs> and Linda, you have been fantastic supporters. Um, thanks for getting a, a, a faz along to open and things like that. That shows that you really um, see the value in these discussions and um, that's a bright future for going forward as well. Thanks to the CTAP community um, and their support. The council was fully behind this uh, and really, really um, supportive. So the next step, so we'll do that uh, target consult consultation. Is that what you mean with where necessary? Or we'll, we, we will be in contact very soon with, with uh, seeking your views on the gaps with the list of things that Rick has been collating over the days. Oh, so that's the second point, the draft summary of identified gaps. Um, and there is this strategic planning process that's going on. Um, we will also do, as a CTAC group, a not a temporary water specific one, but I think a bigger, a, a wider response to uh, the uh, improvement plan that they're looking at and um, thoughts from the members about that. So, so, so look, at the, look out for that. That's going to come a little bit after we do this initial survey about the temporary waters and what are the needs that, so we can um, start thinking um, and working on that. But that's coming too. There is um, a, a consultant, Greg Clayton, who joined us today and he's been listening in and um, we want to help him as much as possible to get the most um, out of the job that he has to do. Have I forgotten anyone? I don't know. But um, again, a huge thank you. Um, thank you to the AV team 
uh, guys, I don't like, you know, I'm sure you're much well educated about temporary waters now. So um, if you need a job, we, we can point you in the uh, direction of some people. Oh, thanks to ASN events. Like, um, Marianne, I drove her absolutely nuts with this one and um, she did a great job pulling it all together. So thank you to them. And I, on that, I think I will wrap it up and thank you all again. Well done, <laughs> Thank you.